It was odd that the weather eased on the turn of winter. The artificial weather system had used all the moisture in the atmosphere, and the tribe wondered if they would ever see winter without snow in the valley ever again. The clear air and quiet were disturbed before long when the sound of rabid yelps and barks approached from over the horizon. The hamlet closed its walls against the pack of scarier ridden timber wolves. Even if this was a fight they wanted to take, all harmonists refused to bear arms against the venerated wolf unless in mortal peril. Stumpy took advantage of this and reclused himself indoors. However, after falling into his comfort zone, minimal hardships took more toll than they should. One day, whilst running errands in the square, he snapped. Following the example of Shinichi and Shorty, he took to insulting everyone he laid eyes on. Stumpy told Worm that her mother was so large that he would have to slaughter all the animals in the valley just to make a parka for her. Shorty and Robinson tried to ignore him and chatted about what Vix might be cooking for dinner, but Stumpy interrupted them to add that Shorty would eat the same food as a goat if he could. Though acting brazen, he delivered his insult with a nervous hesitancy that was more irritating than harsh or intimidating. So, later, when he followed Robinson back to the temple and called him a chunky monkey, the sheriff punched him in the jaw. Robinson continued to dominate the fight that followed, but the tides changed when Stumpy launched a desperate attack that shattered his opponent's femur and destroyed the leg. After Stumpy had recovered from his own injuries, he was sent away from the valley to find the leader of Ubium who was passing by the area. It was a form of punishment that gave Stumpy a chance to redeem himself, should he manage to successfully engage with Mikar Walls in peace talks. On Stumpy's day of departure, Robinson received a peg leg to replace what was lost. Tomoko was enjoying all the new friends that had decided to stay at Red Pine Valley. The newest of these settlers was a cheeky and playful raccoon who had been named Gubbins. Whilst not all were allowed to stay here, the tribe made accommodations where they could, and as the tribe grew, it never seemed to lose its flow or balance. Of all the core values, Tomoko appreciated harmony the most. That did not mean they had to be static either as McKay always encouraged her to further their development. McKay was especially pleased when Tomoko pinned down a successful formula for refining the cycloid leaf into new administrable products that were also necessary in the synthesis of Vix's Go Juice. Tomoko was a skilled medic, practiced in more modern medicines and a keen researcher. Since that breakthrough and long-awaited advent of having a sustainable Go Juice production line, the budding science team shifted their focus to industry. McKay was Tomoko's mentor and easily impressed the girl with her exceptional skill in both tinkering and designing. So, Tomoko had no issues when she frequently found the workshop already occupied by the older genie. That just meant that she could pursue her other interests and regularly ran off to the construction team where Robinson and Shorty would help her in erecting the requisition monument from the Shattered Empire. Still only 16, whilst outside the walls of the hamlet, Tomoko fell prey to a hungry cougar who mistakenly saw her as an easy snack. This never faced the sanguine girl's mindset or productivity, and when the fearful construction was completed, her curiosity with the rewarded psychic harmonizer intoxicated her. For Tomoko, it seemed like joy was never far from around the corner, and she was again feeling happy when more friends appeared. Not only had Stumpy returned from his successful peace talks, but Kabaz decided to join the tribe. It seems like nothing could go wrong. The out of control starship burst into flames above Red Pine Valley and fell just outside the walls. From the wreckage emerged a handsome man in a crimson hood and cloak. He was accompanied by three other men, heavily armed with automatic weaponry. Without warning, they attacked the colony, 
and like so many before them, underestimated the tribe's defences. When Bud, their leader, fell to one of the many traps outside the walls, the others ran. After being hauled into the dungeon, it was clear that Bud's wounds were too severe and it seemed he would die there. In fact, it appeared that he had already died, but when his would-be fatal wounds started to heal spontaneously, Vix understood that Bud was a sacrophage. Shorty had a fledgling interest in medicine and had heard stories of the elusive sanguifage. They were said to be beautiful creatures, strong and fast. It was said that they could not be killed. Shorty discussed the creature with Tomoko as she tended to one of Bud's captured thralls in a nearby bed. With her back turned, she could not see Shorty edging closer to the living corpse of Bud as he lay in death rest. The two exchanged stories of the strange abilities that Sanguifages possessed, such as being able to fly, or that they would never age no matter how much time passed. Shorty was 14 and still naturally curious. He just wanted to see what the face of a Sanguifage looked like, but it was hidden behind Bud's hood. Tomoko had heard that their pretty eyes could see in the dark. Shorty's fascination and longing for beauty that he had bore since losing his nose at the age of nine drove him forward. He went to pull back the man's hood, but as soon as he grabbed the wolf skin fabric, his insides ballooned with a great surge of clarity and power before he collapsed. When Shinichi returned to the prison cell, he was horrified to find Shorty unconscious on the floor. It wasn't until Shinichi's exclamations that Tomoko noticed herself. Shorty had fallen to the floor so gracefully he hadn't made a sound. When the boy was escorted back to his room, he was entirely unrousable. Neither Shinichi nor Vix knew what was wrong with him. His skin felt dry, but any scars that Shorty had on his body were fading away. Shinichi looked upon the face that, were it not for him, would still have a nose and both ears, and Shinichi was filled with sadness. Shorty's striking face almost looked normal to him now, as the boy lay with his eyes agonisingly closed. During a period of meditation, Shinichi realised what must be done. The anima tree stood proud in the crisp air of the morning, on the 12th of August, 5502. The white anima grass had slowly risen and fell for the last year and a half since they had arrived, but now it had swelled to surround the tree. As the naturalists in the tribe gathered around, Shinichi was shocked to find that he did not have to carry Shorty, for he was already awake. Shinichi beckoned him forward and without a word being said, all watched as Shorty psychically linked himself to the anima tree of Red Pine Valley. For a long time, Shinichi had looked forward to bonding with their mighty tree himself, but his kindness had always led him to putting the needs and wants of others before his own. McKay had been feeling immense relief for days now, not only were all safe and happy, but since work was finished on psychoid synthesis and the fearful construction, she was free to pursue whatever it was that interested her. Were she not born as a delicate genie, McKay would have been a rough and tumble brawler, but she could still spot physical ability where she saw it. Shorty had caught and struck down a deer with nothing but an iqua without taking a scratch. She now dedicated her brilliant mind to developing fierce blades and armour that Shorty could wield, similar to the ones the tribe before could craft. Though the valley had defensive fortifications and they were now in possession of automatic weapons, McKay focused on her work in anticipation of greater dangers to come. McKay had always felt guilty when considering Shorty, as she realised the advantages that her own pretty features gave when compared to his mangled face that repulsed most. 
that sentiment didn't seem as potent to her now as she watched the competent teenager race around the hamlet. So, biotech hit really hard this um, episode when they landed a bloody vampire outside Red Pine Valley. Um, that and the anima bonding um, made, ended up being quite a lot of fantasy. Um, also, these end credits are starting to take a really long time with all the characters that are adding up uh, staying at the Hamlet. Although I suppose once you hit 10, it's probably more like a village. Um, yeah, and at the end of this one, the colony had survived 106 days. <laughs> <laughs>